So please give Skylar a big at Promotion Summit Berlin. Welcome to the virtual stage. Over to you, Skylar. Ah, uh, thank you, James. Uh, yeah, excited to be here and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, so as, as James mentioned, um, I'll be talking about how to amp up your screen flow, screenshot optimization flow uh, with something that we developed, which is called uh, an experiment flywheel. So I'll just go ahead and get into it. So uh, yeah, so I, I'm an ASO consultant at Feature uh, based in Berlin. Um, and for those who don't know, uh, Features in uh, a mobile growth consultancy. Um, and here's just a look at some of the different apps that we've worked with. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, so what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, an overview of screenshot testing um, and then looking at the challenges that we face with screenshot testing. Uh, then I'll be introducing the flywheel framework uh, that, that we've developed. Um, and then we'll just talk about uh, how this framework has improved our workflow. Um, so yeah, when we, when we manage ASO for clients, one of the things that we do is we're constantly trying to optimize the assets to uh, increase conversion rates. Um, and screenshots are one of the, uh, the more valuable assets to optimize. Um, and this framework came about just uh, from our experiences um, doing that on a daily basis. So that's, that's where this comes from. Okay, so first we'll talk about an overview of screenshot testing. Um, this is our, this is the features ASO stack. Um, and what this is, it's a framework that looks at each of the different elements related to ASO and, and splits them out into different, different categories. Um, and if you haven't seen this before, there's a lot of really useful information uh, in there. And I would definitely suggest checking it out if you're maybe new to uh, App Store optimization or if you just haven't seen it. Uh, and you can find more information about that on the feature website. Uh, so for the purposes of today's presentation, uh, we're going to be looking at the screenshot section, um, as you probably could have imagined. And uh, this lives within the increasing conversion section of the ASO stack. Uh, so what we have here, this is an overview of the different assets that you have in the Play Store and the App Store uh, and the impact of optimizing uh, those different assets. So basically, the more visible an asset is, um, the more potential you have to increase the conversion rate by optimizing that asset. Um, and if we take a look at the screenshot section, you can see that these are pretty valuable, uh, especially the first, the first set of screenshots. And the reason being uh, is because um, as you look towards the, the further end, so as you get into the, the later screenshots, the percentage of people that scroll all the way to the end uh, is a lot lower. So um, screenshots are important and specifically the first, the first uh, few of them. Uh, so at this moment, I actually want to call attention to the uh, the poll that we actually have up um, in swap card. So um, let's see. Um, yeah, so basically we have a poll up. Uh, one of the questions is, when was the last time you updated your screenshot design, uh, either in the App Store or the Play Store? Um, and the second question is, did you test the screenshots before updating them. Uh, I can see that there are some votes in, but I'm not quite sure how to see the results. Um, but anyways, maybe we can refer to that later, but uh, if, yeah, okay, there we go. All right, so I can see, yeah, 83% of people updated the screenshots less than a month ago, that's really good. Um, and 17% between three and six months ago. Um, and, 100% of people said that they did not test them before, uh, before updating them. Um, okay, this is really good info to, to kind of kick off the session. And I think we can, we can uh, uh, refer back to that uh, throughout, the, throughout the session. So why do we test screenshots? Um, as I kind of mentioned earlier, uh, the, there are many reasons, but here are kind of the main reasons that, that we 
uh, test screenshots on a day-to-day -day basis. So first we want to improve the conversion rates. Um, an example of that would be, so uh, we were able to increase our conversion rates in the US by X percent by updating our screenshot design. That's great. Uh, better conversion rates mean more people uh, install in your app. So this is good news. Uh, another reason is to generate country specific learning. So we're not always only optimizing um, assets for like the English speaking mar market, for example. Sometimes we're dealing with other markets, maybe Asian markets or, or the German market or something like that. Um, and generating some really country specific learnings is something that we, uh, that, that is really valuable uh, when you're testing screenshots, because as we know, uh, different countries have different preferences and, and things like that. Um, so an example of that would be uh, users in Japan might prefer screenshots with the colorful background uh, and iconography in the screenshots. This is just an example. I don't know if that's true, but this is, this is an example of something that would be maybe a country specific learning for Japan. Um, and then where do we test screenshots? Um, well, we do that in the Google Play Store. Uh, and the reason for that is that they actually have a native experimentation platform built into the, um, the Play Console. Um, so anybody who's, who's, uh, who's worked with this would know that uh, the App Store doesn't have this type of native experimentation platform. Um, so it's just a lot easier uh, on the Play Store and they have a lot of they make it really easy for you. They have um, like results, you know, you can clearly see uh, the result of the experiment and add a 90% confidence interval. So we do that mainly on the Google Play Store. I'll talk a little bit about the App Store later, but the main purposes about this, of this presentation will be focusing on the Play Store. Okay, so now moving on to the challenges with testing screenshots. So first of all, screen screenshot testing is complex. So there are many elements at play that determine whether, um, whether or not a set of screenshots will help improve your conversion rate. And all these different elements are working in unison uh, to kind of determine if it's, if, it's a if it's a success or not. Uh, so we have some things like the color scheme, um, the screen grab content. So that would be like the content that you're displaying on uh, in the actual screenshots uh, to showcase your device, uh, your app's features, uh, the copy, uh, screenshot order maybe. Uh, and there's a, a many more, uh, many more elements that are kind of coming into play here. Um, and for those that might be new to screenshot testing, uh, we also have some best practices here. So um, when it comes to the color scheme, keeping the brand consistent, but also allowing for some flexibility um, on screen grab content, you want to showcase that content uh, as clearly and easily to understand as possible. Uh, when it comes to copy, keeping it short uh, and making sure that it's readable, but also providing enough info, so kind of balancing that. Um, and when it comes to screenshot order, uh, you'd want to put the, the most valuable features of your app at the beginning. And the reason for that is just because, as we mentioned earlier, uh, the percentage of people that actually scroll through your entire set of screenshots drops off um, as, as you go. So uh, the first screenshots, you wanna kind of put your best foot forward there. All right. Um, the next thing that we wanted to talk about is that iterative testing is important. Um, and iterative testing, of course, refers to um, only making one specific change at a time. Uh, and what that might look like would be, you know, maybe you, um, you change the background color to the screenshot, uh, to your set of screenshots. Then you do a separate test, which is maybe you change the orientation. Maybe you had all portrait screenshots and then you've changed them to all landscape. Um, and you'd run that as a test then you'd move on to changing the copy. So in each test, you're actually just uh, changing one element at a time. And the reason we do this is this really helps us zero in on specific elements that are improving uh, the conversion rates and which ones are not doing so well. Uh, so I'll kind of get into that uh, in the next slide. 
Um, yeah, so iterative testing, it may seem more time consuming, uh, and it is because you're just doing one uh, small thing at a time, but even minor changes can have a significant impact. Uh, so for this example, we're going to be looking at a little app called Recibud. This is actually uh, not a real app. This is just something that, that uh, this is a made up app that we use for uh, creating design mockups and things like that. Um, but this result here uh, is actually a real result that we saw from just from changing, uh, from moving one screenshot up to the front, uh, similar to what we did here. So we took the screenshot that was in the one, two, three, in the fifth position, and we moved it up to the second position. Uh, and, and you can see uh, an uplift of between one and 3% uh, in your conversion rate, just from making that one change. So let's look at an example of what happens when you don't make iterative changes. Um, so I'm just going to stop for a minute and let you guys uh, try to pick out all the different things uh, that, that we've, all the different changes that we've made between the current version and the test variant. Uh, and in that time, I'm also going to have a look at the chat to see if there's any questions or anything that I can address right now. Okay. Sorry about that. It kicked me out of the thing. All right. Uh, yeah. So. Okay. Uh, yeah. So um, a few things that you can notice straight away. Um, the most noticeable probably being that we've changed the orientation. So in the top we have uh, one landscape followed by a bunch of different portrait screenshots, and in the test variant. Uh, you can see that they've all switched to all portrait. Uh, we've also, on the first screen, we've added some iconography. Um, yeah, we've also changed the screenshot order. So we've changed, the, uh, yeah, we've moved one screenshot. Uh, we've swapped the screenshots in the second and third position. Um, and some kind of parallel changes that have also happened is one, the um, the devices have become a lot bigger. You can you can see the uh, the UI and everything a, a lot better. The copy is a bit bigger, a bit more readable. Um, and then as a trade off uh, from uh, from the you won't be able to see as many screenshots just without scrolling, uh, just because those landscape screenshots are taking up more space. So the point being here is that we uh, we've actually made a lot of changes here. Um, and the problem with this is that whether the experiment is a win or a loss, uh, we wouldn't uh, be able to say for sure what was actually contributing to that result. So is it because things, because uh, the copy is a bit more readable now? Uh, is it because we moved a different feature up to the, up in the screenshot order? Uh, is it because somehow the iconography was kind of resonating with people better? Um, and and these, this is one of the uh, the issues that comes in when you're not doing iterative testing, uh, as you can see by the, the little emoji person in the corner there. Um, yeah, we, we don't actually know exactly what's going on there. Um, so that being said, uh, while iterative testing does alleviate some changes, it's not the be all end all. So it's not gonna actually, uh, it's not gonna actually solve everything. Um, and we'll discuss why. Uh, I know this sounds kind of counterintuitive, but later on in the presentation, we'll, we'll kind of talk about how we, how we approach this and, and kind of came up with a solution for that. So um, the issue is screenshot designs for the same app will begin to look very differently uh, in different countries at some point. Um, and that's because we're constantly testing and adding different elements um, and only implementing those once uh, a test has shown to actually increase the conversion rate. So in this example here, you can see um, maybe we have an app for the US and for the UK, uh, both English speaking countries, but it could be that uh, through our iterative testing way down the line, eventually these designs have kind of gone astray. And this can become problematic from a brand point of view. 
So if you ever want to do maybe a rebrand or just realign the look and feel of your screenshots across countries, um, you're going to face some issues uh, if you want to stick to this iterative approach. And to realign the look and feel for these two countries could take a really long time through iterative testing because you'd have to keep making subtle changes to each of them and hope that at some point they, they converge again. Um, so this, this is one of the main issues with iterative testing. So we were faced with a dilemma uh, and that is how to approach these complexities. So we want to address the following points simultaneously. So one, we want to be able to realign countries once they've strayed. Um, two, we want to improve the conversion rates in multiple countries at the same time. Uh, and three, we want to generate uh, some market specific learnings. We want to continue to generate those market specific learnings because uh, that's gonna really help us optimize uh, our, our screenshots in each specific country. Um, and obviously we, we want to stick to an iterative approach uh, along the way uh, for the reasons we talked about earlier. Uh, and this can be a kind of a challenging task. Um, so you can see by the little, little emoji people again, uh, it's not the easiest conundrum to figure out. So um, we kind of developed a way to adapt to this um, and I'm gonna uh, introduce that to you. And this is with something called the flame, flywheel framework. And here's an overview of what that looks like. Uh, so I know there's a lot going on here. Um, we're going to break it down piece by piece, but um, a couple things. You, so the way you should look at this is kind of like a clock. So you start at the top uh, and then move through one, two, three, all the way till you get back to 12. Um, and the first thing, the main thing I want, to, I want you to focus on for this, uh, in this image is just that new design that's, that's up at the number one position. Um, because it all starts with implementing a new design. And then we'll go over the different, uh, the different numbers and the inner circle and things like that. Uh, but first, just focus on that new design. So what is the experiment flywheel? Um, it's composed of uh, four main elements. Uh, so the first one is developing a new design. Uh, the second one is iterative testing on multiple elements of that design. Uh, the third would be to gather learnings along the process. And the fourth is to create a new design reset after all testing has been completed and running through another round of tests. Let me just check the... Yeah. Let me see if there's any questions going. Okay, maybe it's better if I just, uh, I'm going to have some time at the end, so maybe it's better if I just answer the questions and look at the poll at the end of the, uh, at the end of the presentation. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, those are the four elements. And then some people might ask why it, it is called the flywheel. Uh, and the reason for that is at the beginning, when you're running through these tests, uh, it might be it might go a bit slow, slowly because, you know, it's, it might be your first time uh, going through tests in a specific market for a specific app. But as you, as you do more and more cycles, uh, you'll be able to gather stronger learnings and uh, you'll be able to flow through the cycle a bit more smoothly, I would say. So step one, developing a design reset. Um, so the first step would be, yeah, this is, this is the first step. Uh, you want to figure out um, what the issue is and you know, maybe the issue is that you just want to re redesign or rebrand or something like that. Um, or you might just want, maybe the, the screenshots have become dated uh, and you want to just refresh those. So the first thing is uh, you want to settle on a design uh, with your design team and, and figure out what you actually want to implement. Um, and a couple of things to keep in mind uh, it, when, when it comes to the design reset, it's okay for the new design to be completely different from the old one. I know we talked about uh, the, the issues that come with that, but um, the rest of the flywheel framework kind of uh, answers those questions. So it's okay for it to be completely different from the old one. As you can see in the old design and redesign examples that we have here, the new design is completely different. Um, 
Some other things to keep in mind, uh, it's definitely a good idea to include elements that have proven to increase the conversion rate if you have that information. Um, if not, it's also okay. Um, and it's also a good time to fast track any new trends that you, that you think could work, for you, that could work well for your app. So maybe you see that there's a specific trend. Uh, for example, in this case, we have uh, one portrait screenshot followed by, or one landscape followed by multiple portraits. So that's something that you can really fast track into your design. Um, yeah, uh, this is a good time to do that. Um, and the last thing to keep in mind, this is the intention is to create a design that you're going to implement across all countries. Uh, so when you create this design, uh, the, the design will kind of like be the same for all the countries, but obviously the copy and possibly the, uh, the screen grab content uh, might be different. Okay, so here's an example of the thought process that we may have gone through to create this, uh, this new design reset. Um, so we might have said, okay, a square splash screen will help. Uh, and let me also just uh, clarify, splash screen, anytime we're talking about splash screen, we're talking about the, uh, that whatever's in that number one position, if it kind of has like a different design um, to the rest of the, to the screenshots. Uh, so that's what we're talking about there. And anytime we refer to value props, uh, that just means like the copy uh, that you're seeing in each of the screenshots or on the first screen. Um, yeah, so those are the value props, just in case uh, that's unclear. So the thought process would go like this. A square splash screen uh, will help the app stand out from its competitors. Maybe the, the other competitors aren't doing this and we think that this can be kind of eye-catching. Um, another thing we might say is that the new colors will catch the users' users' attention. Um, obviously, you can see the new color is a bit more bright uh, than the old gray, so that could be something uh, that we want to incorporate. Um, we might have seen that short value props in the past performed well, so we're going we're to keep those uh, and take them with us into the new design. Um, and then we're also going to test if switching to device outlines instead of real devices impacts the performance. It could be that maybe it, it gives the app more, I don't know, a different look uh, and somehow um, resonates with users and, and maybe that would improve the conversion rates. So that's just an example of how we would uh, go about developing a design reset. Okay. So we've managed to address one of the complexities. So now we have a way to realign uh, countries, one, country designs once they've strayed. Um, and the way we do that is by yeah, developing this design reset for all the different countries that hopefully we can then implement in all those different countries. So that's good news. Moving on to step two. Uh, step two deals with testing different elements of the design. Uh, so this is when the iterative testing comes into play. So screenshots are made up of many different uh, testable elements. Um, we've identified a lot of them here. Um, there may be more that, that maybe the audience can think of, um, but we, we've kind of just put out, uh, a I guess, the major ones uh, that we've worked with and we've noticed can impact performance. Um, and what we've done is we've split those into four different categories. Um, just to make it kind of easier to understand. So we have first the overall appearance. Um, those are elements that contribute to the overall look. Maybe those are things that catch your attention straight away. Um, and that would be things like the background color, for example. Um, then we move on to communication. Uh, so that's everything that has to do with communicating with the user. So that could be the copy in, the, in your screenshots. Uh, that could even be um, your company logo uh, and branding to kind of, uh, that's, that's a way to communicate uh, to your customers that it, or to the potential user that, um, you know, to kind of like throw your brand awareness around there. Um, or feature icons, you know, maybe this kind of is a way to communicate the different features of the, of the app. Uh, then we have macro composition. So these are elements um, that kind of alter the, the screenshots themselves. These are bigger changes. So that could be something like the orientation, 
uh, where you're just adjusting the size of the screenshot or the screenshot order, um, where you're just moving moving the screenshots themselves around, but not not particularly making uh, many changes inside the screenshots. Um, and then micro composition, composition. So these are elements within the screenshots. So these are like uh, the screen grabs <clears throat> or in-app content. Uh, you can also say uh, the devices. Um, maybe changing the device size, uh, removing the device altogether and having just like UI floating there. So these are changes that are kind of uh, more subtle um, and but they can still impact conversion and that's why we put them into this micro composition category. Okay, so step two will actually act as your testing roadmap. So in step two, you'll decide which elements to test and in which order. <clears throat> um, and the idea being that each iteration you choose will be tested in all the countries that you're trying to optimize screenshots in. We'll go through some examples in a minute. So um, hopefully that'll be a little bit more clear. Um, but you can pick any of the different elements that you want to test. Uh, you can test them in any order. Um, and your thought process on what to test and in which order is really just going to depend on the specific app. So what's the time frame like? Um, what goals are you trying to achieve? Um, and things like that. So an example flywheel cycle could look like this. Uh, we can we start with the design reset always. Uh, then maybe we want to add some icon iconography. Um, so making a change to the communication. Uh, then we might want to test a different background color or a few different background colors. So the good thing about uh, the Google Play Store is that you can actually test up to three different iterations. So you can have uh, in your current version and then a uh, three, yeah, three additional variants. So A, B, C, D testing. Um, so you can actually test up to three different background colors if you like. Um, then we're going to ch make changes to the value prop uh, proposition, so the copy, um, and then uh, maybe we'll end off by changing the screenshot order to see if any of these iterations uh, improves the conversion rate uh, with the end goal of hopefully applying this, this new design uh, in all the markets. So putting it all into practice. Um, here are some principles on how to work, how to methodically work through the iterations. Um, so we start with the design reset, as I said, uh, then we always reiterate on that design until we have uh, a winning element. So if we have a win winning element, then that will get carried over into the next iteration. Um, yeah, and anything that didn't win will not get carried over. So uh, I'll ha have some examples for you guys here to kind of visually see what that looks like. Um, yeah, so here we have the US and Germany. Uh, this is the design reset. Uh, we tested in the US and Germany and it didn't win. Um, so we didn't apply that. Uh, yeah, the design reset was not applied in either the US nor Germany. So we move on to making our first iteration on the design reset. Okay, so the first iteration, uh, we added these little uh, this iconography here, and we can see that in the US that improved the conversion rate, uh, while in Germany it didn't. So in the next iteration, we're going to keep those uh, th that iconography in the US, but we're going to leave it out in Germany. So what that would look like is this here. So you can see in the US, um, yeah, when we move on to the next iteration, which is changing the background color, uh, we take the, the icons with us in the U.S., but we leave those out in Germany because they didn't, they didn't, um, yeah, they weren't successful there. Uh, and we would work through in this in this manner. So let's say that by changing the background colors, that one was not su successful in the U.S., but it was in Germany. Well, in that case, um, the next iteration in Germany would also maintain that pink color. Whereas the next iteration in the U.S. would uh, would still have that purple color and the icons. All right. So now we've figured out we've answered two of the how to approach these two complexity two of the complexities out of three. So we've figured out how to realign the countries once the designs have strayed. 
uh, and we figured out how to improve the conversion rate in multiple countries. That's really good news. So now we just have to tackle this third one here, which is to generate market specific learnings. So um, one thing that you should do if you're using this type of uh, framework is to track the results and gather those learnings. Um, and this is really just going to help you out uh, in the future. So you can always, you know, maybe once you've been testing for a year or so, you can look back and see like, okay, what was working then? Maybe what had been working and what isn't now. And, you know, it's just a really good uh, point of reference. Um, this is a really uh, rudimentary way to track them. There's probably more sophisticated ways to do that. But, um, you know, anything, any way that helps you track uh, these results uh, is going to help you out. And what that might look like is something like this. So we have uh, multiple different countries here. We have the US, Italy, Brazil, Japan. Um, then we have our different experiments that we ran and how each of them performed uh, in each of those countries. Um, having some kind of layout like this is, is a good way to kind of pick out kind of common themes between two countries. So we've found that uh, sometimes two countries will have kind of like similar preferences and uh, other countries will, will kind of like have different preferences. So in this, in this example, we can see that maybe a specific background color was popular in the U.S. and Japan, uh, but not in Italy and Brazil. However, uh, high, you know, using a certain type of copy, um, maybe that could be the value proposition in Italy and Brazil was successful, whereas that same copy wouldn't, maybe wasn't successful in the U.S. and Japan. So. Uh, what we'll want to do is that after you finish, you know, running through your cycle and uh, uh, collecting all these results, uh, this will give you a bit more insight into what's actually uh, pushing the needle in each country and what's not. Um, and the main thing here is that you'll want to carry these learnings over into your next uh, design reset flywheel cycle um, to revalidate them and to also test some new hypotheses. So. It might be that you see that, uh, you know, using all landscape screenshots uh, has been successful in the US. Um, well, if it, just because it happened one time, we can't say that, you know, 100% that's going to work every time. So we want to, one, revalidate this. Um, and then two, another thing is that sometimes the uh, trends and things like that will just change. So. Um, yeah, so we want to continue testing these to make sure that we're kind of staying on top of staying on the ball with with what's uh, with what's working and what's not. Um, yeah, and then after you've gained some solid learnings, you can even create design resets with minor differences between countries based on what has proven to perform better. Uh, yeah, so what that means uh, is there's a, a lot of flexibility with using this type of framework. So, for example, you might have uh, say a photo editing app, um, and if you're optimizing in the U.S. Uh, and in Asia, say Japan, for example, uh, you might see that it works better to have you know all the people in your photos to have uh, Western people in a Western country and to to kind of have uh, Asian people in an Asian country. Uh, in this case, you can have the same basic design template for your design reset, but you can have those minor changes, uh, minor differences uh, in there and then continue on with your flywheel cycle. So it's really flexible and it really just depends on the amount of insight you have going into it. All right, so there we go. We've, uh, we've figured out how to address these different challenges. Uh, so we found out how to realign the countries. That's with a design reset that we can hopefully implement in all countries. Um, and even if those, you know, even with the iterations, even if there are minor changes, they're still going to have a, a certain level of consistency to them um, compared to if we just did pure iterative testing. Uh, so that's one. Two, we figured out how to improve the conversion rates in multiple countries. Uh, and three, we figured out how to generate some market specific learnings by tracking our results and, and reanalyzing. And we're pretty chuffed about that. So that's good news. So now we'll look into how this framework has improved our workflow. So this is, uh, these are some examples of how we, uh, 
how we've uh, found working with this framework. All right, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do uh, manage ASO for clients uh, and we work with them a lot. So um, when we're managing ASO, we found that this flywheel uh, is really helpful for managing the client's expectations. Uh, and the reason being is that it provides them with a clear testing roadmap uh, of what's, what's to come and what the, the estimated timeline is and why exactly we're testing these things. And uh, a lot of times if the client is not familiar with screenshot testing, this is kind of a really good way to ease them in. They can see it like logically uh, and, and they can understand why we're doing it. Uh, it also helps internally. So it helps align our various uh, members from different teams. So we have, you know, maybe the design team and the consultancy team and, and this, uh, this framework kind of helps uh, align everybody. Um, yeah. So this, this, this is a benefit that we've seen. This also helps us to efficiently allocate resources. Uh, and the reason being is that creating a new screenshot design takes a lot of effort uh, from the design side. Uh, so first you have to brainstorm, then you have to kind of like figure out, I'm not a designer, so I, I might not be doing this any justice, but you know, I, I'm sure there's a lot of work that goes into it, maybe different iterations and things like that. Uh, but uh, I know it does take a lot of work um, and if we weren't, uh, if we weren't using some kind of iterative testing model, then if this, uh, this new design was not successful for some reason, all that work would have to get thrown out the window. However, since we're making all iterations on this new design, um, we're able to kind of conserve those efforts. Uh, and then, so at least the base design is still the same, but we're just making small changes. So it does help to, uh, it does, I think the designers do appreciate the fact that their work is, is still able to, to live on, even if it's not success on the first go. Um, it could just be that maybe one of the elements is just not right for that particular design. And that's what we're trying to get to the root of uh, by doing this iterative testing. Yeah, okay. So that was efficiently allocate resources. Uh, the next one, uh, better alignment across locales. So um, I know I, I mentioned this a bit earlier, but I didn't provide any examples. Um, but here is the actual example. I was scared that I forgot to include that, but here it is. Okay, so alignment across countries. Uh, since we're making iterations on the same design, all countries will maintain some level of consistency uh, once an iteration gets applied. So you can see here um, in this example, we have the US, Germany, and the UK. Um, you, can, you can immediately see that there is some kind of consistency there, though there are many subtle changes uh, within the screenshots themselves. So in the US, uh, we have a different screenshot order. Um, maybe in the US, people find uh, the recipes um, feature of the app more valuable. Um, we also have icons in the splash screen on that first screen there. Then moving on to the UK, uh, we can see that they all have a diff all the screenshots have a different orientation to what the original design reset was. So we have all landscape. Um, we also have icons on the splash screen, uh, similar to the US. And then looking at Germany, we have a different background color. Uh, maybe this color just kind of uh, resonates more with this type of app in, in Germany or something like that. Um, we don't have icons in the splash screen and we have a different value pro proposition on the splash screen. So the first uh, screenshot that users see will talk about uh, quick recipes, easy cooking, this type of thing. Whereas in the uh, English speaking markets, you can see that um, talking about referring to the healthy health features of the app are kind of resonating with the, with the, with your users more. Market specific learnings. Um, yeah, we're able to generate and revalidate market specific learning. So, uh, in this example, we've discovered some market specific learnings that we can carry over into our next round of testing for revalidation or just to kind of, um, put us in the right direction from the start. So, we might say iconography works well in the US. Um, yeah, 
I think I've already talked a lot about this, but the main the main point is that we can actually carry these these different uh, elements over into the next design reset and kind of balance them across all countries. Um, yeah, and then run through another cycle of the flywheel, uh, where we'll be able to generate even more specific learnings, or we'll, we'll be able to kind of um, reinforce what we had previously learned, or maybe even disprove what we thought was a learning the first time around. Uh, let's see how we're doing on time. Okay. Um, yeah, then carrying learnings over to the App Store. So this is a really important one. Uh, I mentioned at the very beginning that uh, the App Store doesn't have a native testing platform like the way Google Play does. Um, there are a few ways that you can test in the App Store. <clears throat> uh, for example, using Apple search ads, you can, you can test creatives in that way. Um, you can you can just implement new uh, a new design and then just check the conversion rate before and after. Uh, though these methods are not uh, they're not as good as if you were to do just a an A/B test like you can uh, on the Play Store. But one thing that we are able to do is to see what learnings have we gathered from the Play Store and use those as a directionally on how we can. Uh, you know, update our screenshots in the app store. And this, this is, this proves to be really valuable, um, especially since you don't have much to go off uh, in terms of testing in the app store anyways. And this is taking me to the final point. Uh, best of all, the flywheel is really flexible. So uh, we intentionally made the, intentionally made this uh, flexible enough to fit a wide range of different apps. So we, uh, you know, feature um, manages ASO for a lot of different types of apps. So we wanted something that was flexible enough to be a, uh, that that other apps could use it. Um, we want it to be able to fit different goals. So you might have an app that's very small, and you know, getting to statistic statistical significance uh, might take a long time. Um, different time frames, etc. Uh, this is really, it, it's really flexible. So it, it's, it's able to be applied for the, yeah, a lot of different scenarios. Um, there's no limit to how many or how few iterations you need to test. Um, so you can kind of just pick through uh, any of the, the different elements we mentioned here, or maybe some that we didn't mention and kind of decide for yourself which ones you'd like to test. Uh, and they can be tested in any order really. So internally in our company, we've seen, uh, we've gotten sign off from both designers uh, and ASO consultants. And we've seen this to, uh, starting to get adopted more and more. Um, and we've already started to see some positive results um, in terms of everything that I discussed earlier. So market specific learnings, uh, realignment and uh, improving conversion rates. So um, yeah, if you enjoyed uh, what you saw here, then definitely feel free to adopt the framework or just take parts of it and adapt it to your own uh, screenshot testing workflow and let us know how it works out for you. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me on Slack in the Slack, ASO Stack Slack channel, if you're a member of that or via email, uh, it's down there below. Uh, I think we do still have some time, so I'm going to actually take a look at the poll and the uh, questions in the chat to see if there's anything that maybe I didn't address that we can uh, touch on now. All right. Uh -oh. One second. All right. Okay. Uh, let's see questions we have here. Wow, it's a lot of questions. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. I know it's the chat. Sorry. What is your opinion on video as a first screen? Okay, so this is a question that says, what is your opinion on video as a first screen? 
uh, not game app, but any special feature. Um, I think it can work. I know Google Play is starting to, so one of the main issues in the past was that uh, with video, uh, Google Play used to reroute you to, face, uh, to YouTube, uh, whereas the App Store, um, it, it just auto plays in your feed. Obviously that creates some friction if you have to jump off to YouTube, um, it, you can see some drop off there. Uh, but I know they are trying to roll out some sort of autoplay. So I don't know if it's testing or what. I'm not exactly up to date on the, the exact status of that. But uh, I know that there have been some sightings that it's autoplaying. Um, but even when, when, if it is a video that you have to jump to YouTube for, I mean, I've personally seen that it, it has improved conversion rates. Um, and I've also seen instances where it hasn't. So I'd say it really, it really depends. So you, that's, that's the beauty of testing in the Play Store is uh, you can actually test that there. And uh, I would say just test it and see how it, see how it works out. Do you use the same design for iOS and Android or are there major differences do you think need to be taken into consideration between the two stores? Yeah, uh, so I kind of touched on that in the previous slide uh, that we do like to carry over some of our learnings, but the thing is we do just use it directionally because there are differences between the, the two stores. So uh, there's actually loads of differences. So there's, there's differences between Android users and, and iPhone users, and even the way that they interact with their, their phones and with the app stores and things like that. So um, even when we're porting over some learnings from Google Play to the app store, we still want to test, you know, say if we're implementing something in the app store, we want to still test the conversion rate after um, or, or use ASA to test that. Let me see, find another one. Now, oh, does the file name of a screenshot influence the ranking for specific keywords like an alt text on an image in Google SEO? That's actually a really good question. Um, I don't know, actually. I think that uh, is interesting to test and you know what, thanks. Peter Clerics for that question. Uh, you might be seeing an article from us uh, in the near future. I know we have uh, some members of our team trying to kind of like go deeper on the uh, Play Store algorithm. Um, my gut feeling tells me no. I know the, the Play Store algorithm isn't as sophisticated as the, uh, as the actual Google al algorithm, like the Google uh, search algorithm. Um, uh, yeah even though it's from the same company, but from my experiences, it's not as sophisticated. So I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't, um, if it didn't have an impact, but definitely a good topic to look into. All right. Um, uh, somebody asked if we will share the deck after the presentation, we're actually going to create a, um, a, uh, a blog post about this on the feature blog. Uh, so stay tuned. I think that should be ready in uh, probably in January. Um, so you'll be able to kind of get an overview of that, of this whole presentation there. Uh, do you have some typical things that always seem to work for you, uh, for your screenshots? Uh, that really depends on the app. Um, so um, I guess, one thing that we can say for sure is that, you know, making sure that the uh, subtitles, uh, that, that, the, um, that the copy rather is, is readable. So make sure that there's enough contrast. If you have a light colored text on a light colored background and people are looking on a small device, it, it, might, be, it might not be easy to read. And you might not actually notice that uh, if you're working, if you're designing it on your computer, you know, just because you're seeing it at a, at a much bigger size. So um, that's one. Um, let me think if I could think of some other ones. Um, I mean, there's always new trends popping up. So it, I, the, there's one, there's new trends popping up and two, it really depends on the type of app. So um, yeah, obviously if you're looking for a photo editing app, um, the things that, that are gonna work there are gonna be a lot different than uh, if you're working, if you're looking for like maybe a mobile security app or something where you really need to like uh, read the specific features, whereas in the photo editing app, it's more visual. Uh, I don't know, this might be a bad example, but I think I'd say it depends on the app, but the best practice is never change. Um, so, you know, making sure everything's legible. Um, 
uh, yeah, and things like that. So I, um, but yeah, I would say that's, that's the best way going forward. Um, how long are you letting the test run? Are you waiting for Google uh, to say that the best result is found or are you ending the test before that? So uh, the minimum, we let them run for seven days. That's just because you want, a, you want to get, you know, the full usage flow from the, the weekend and the, during the week. Um, that's just a full cycle. Uh, so the minimum I would say is seven days. Uh, we do wait for Google to uh, declare a winner. So sometimes the, Google might say that, oh yeah, this uh, set of screenshots is is in, uh, increasing the conversion rate. Um, and they might uh, say that after only two days. In that case, I wouldn't stop the test yet, even though Google's already declared it a winner. Um, on top of that, 90% confidence interval is a bit uh, less than you typically would like to use. You know, it'd be nice if they had the option to say, increase the confidence interval to, to a 95% or something like that. But um, I'd say at least seven days and yeah, wait for Google to uh, to uh, call a result. In some cases, um, it, one, of the, one of the problems that you might run into is that you've let it run for maybe a month and you're still seeing needs more data or something like that. Um, in that case, I would say it's probably okay to, to stop that one and uh, focus your, your efforts elsewhere. If it hasn't done anything in a month's time, yeah, you can probably focus your efforts better somewhere else. Um, um, Skylar, can I, um, uh, as we're so sort of close to time now, uh, what I suggest is, I know there's loads of questions still, <laughs> Um, so it's a bit of a Sisyphean task for you. Um, what I suggest is, can you head over on your uh, laptop or, or computer um, when we finish this up over back into the chat and maybe you can answer some sort of in the chat sort of yeah, directly yeah. and then we can pick up any sort of questions that haven't been answered now. Um, and then also maybe you can sort of reply to any others that will create a nice sort of record of, um, yeah, or well, the other ones. So, um, because yeah, clearly a, a lot of interest in this, this session. And, uh, I mean, I always love the, the, the Fitcher, you know, frameworks, as I said at the beginning, and I, I love that, uh, you know, the, the screenshot wheel and taking something, you know, to be able to create a structure around something so micro as the uh you know the iconography or the tiny you know how big is you know how big is the device do you show that you know i think that's just amazing how you create these structures uh you know it's just brilliant and uh yeah really thank you for for sharing that today and deservedly like huge interest so thank you Definitely, and thanks, thanks a lot. I appreciate right. uh, appreciate Great. that. Great. So you're going to head into the chat, and then you're going to answer the the final questions in there. Then, yeah. Yep. Yep. Will do. Great. Um, yeah. All thanks. Right. I uh, enjoyed the opportunity, and it was uh, nice chatting with you guys today. Great. Thanks, guys. So, okay. Yeah. We're 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 heading on next to uh, we got a case study next, I think, and yeah, Skylar's going to be over in the chat. So, lots going on, and uh, thanks, Skylar. Yep, no problem, and uh, have a good one.